Welcome back to CSL TV and I just hope you guys are having a beautiful, blessed day. But in the news you already know how I go. It ain't nothing positive but I will try my best to find some good so it won't be all bad. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel because you'll be doing a good deed by helping me out and the good thing about that is free. Like the video, comment down below what made you watch CSL TV and I'm pretty much just a review, reaction and informational TV. Hopefully. Uh, I'll bring you guys this, you know, content that nobody have brought to y'all. But if not, it's cool anyway, because everybody can be everywhere at all time. If you have a social media platform, share me on your social media platform so people know what we're doing over here at CSL TV. And again, I'm not going to hold you guys up. So have a beautiful, blessed day. Let's get it. Was the infamous serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer's frankly surprising reaction to receiving a life sentence. In closing, I just want to say that I hope God has forgiven me. On July 22nd, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer's heinous crimes were uncovered by the police. The dismembered body parts and skulls of his murder victims were found in his apartment. Police removed boxes and boxes of body parts, evidence of what appears to be a psychopathic mass murder. The Milwaukee monster was finally caught and he was going to face justice for his crimes. Jeffrey Dahmer was questioned by the police for over 60 hours, two weeks straight. During his interrogation, Dahmer would admit to having murdered 16 young men in Wisconsin since 1987, with one earlier victim named Stephen Hicks he killed in Ohio. There was no point in trying to hide hide uh, my actions anymore. Dahmer was tried for 15 counts of first-degree murder and was looking at a permanent stay in prison, but he had no intention of defending himself from the accusations. Instead, he pled guilty to his crimes and awaited the punishment that was to come. I know my time in prison will be terrible, but I deserve whatever I get because of what I have done. Thank you, Your Honor, and I am prepared for your sentence, which I know will be the maximum. I ask for no consideration. Dahmer was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, and psychotic disorder, but was deemed legally sane at the time he committed his many murders. He was even described as a calculating and cunning individual. Yet, during his final moments as a free man, Jeffrey Dahmer seemed apologetic for his heinous crimes. I should have stayed with God. I tried and failed and created a holocaust. Thank God there will be no more harm that I can do. I believe that only the Lord Jesus Christ can save me from my sins. I have instructed Mr. Boyle to end this matter. I do not want to contest the civil case. I have told Mr. Boyle to try and finalize them if he can. If there is ever any money, I want it to go to the victim's families. I have talked to Mr. Boyle about other things that might help ease my conscience in some way of coming up with ideas on how to make some amends to these families, and I will work with him on that. Dharma was sentenced to 16 life sentences for his murders. He would use the trial that sealed his fate to learn more about himself and attempt to atone for his acts. Your Honor, it is over now. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. The doctors have told me about my sickness and now I have some peace. I know how much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. My attempt to help identify the remains was the best that I could do, and that was hardly anything. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I decided to go through this trial for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was to let the world know that these were not hate crimes. I wanted the world in Milwaukee, which I deeply hurt, to know the truth of what I did. I didn't want unanswered questions. All the questions have now been answered. I wanted to find out just what it was that caused me to be so bad and evil. So according to the reports, uh, this guy allegedly fired at the vehicle, um, just hitting the mom in the head. She is suffering none, you know, life-threatening injuries. But it's just weird that nobody else was harmed in the vehicle. It's sad enough 
They're homeless, sleeping in a car while the government giving out all this money to foreign countries and not um, tag attacking what we're dealing with here in America. But uh, it's good to know that, you know, everybody is OK. And you start to wonder if this was a love triangle, like was she cheating? That's how she got pregnant, you know, because I mean, it doesn't seem right for she, her, a pregnant lady to be the only one that gets shot, you know, and everybody else is just unharmed. Um, again, you guys can go ahead and read up on the story. I just had to do a little commentary on how I felt about this and how it is. Today we're taking a look at three of the most bizarre murders with audio and video footage. This first story is truly gruesome, so just steal yourself. 50-year-old Mark Latunsky, also known as the Grinder Cannibal, could have been the next Jeffrey Dahmer if he wasn't caught. On paper, Mark was an intelligent person who claimed to have a master's in chemistry from Iowa State University. At the same time, he was rife with mental illness and diagnosed with both borderline personality disorder and paranoid schizophrenia. Mark began to display erratic, sometimes red flag behavior. He was obsessed with violent torture movies. He stopped shaving and showering. He was often physically and verbally abusive towards his wife, who became his ex-wife, and his four kids. He threatened to kill pets and violated custody agreements. In 2013, he told police that his name was William Gregory Dean and that he had in fact killed Mark Lutunsky himself with the stroke of a pen, which is gibberish as far as we can tell. Sir, are you Mr. Lutunsky? Uh, no, my name is Edgar Thomas Hill. Sir, Mark Lutunsky is my nephew. Mark would later remarry a man named Jamie Arnold. Jamie would soon move out of their shared home, saying that he couldn't get Mark to take his meds and that he was displaying worrying behavior. His sexual trysts, his bizarre obsession with his Viking heritage, and his multiple identities were off-putting, to say the least. Uh, he tried to get me involved. I couldn't take that lifestyle anymore. In October and November of 2019, police received two 911 calls from men claiming to have escaped Mark's basement in Shiawassee County, Michigan. I woke up in the basement. Okay, shining in the basement with a rubber thing on my ankle, and I cut it with the butcher knife that I have a for getting here. Excuse my French. I just want to get out of here and I want to go home. I wanted to care about the legal case I was here for. I'm sorry, I can't help. I want to go home. Okay. I don't, I don't want an incident report. I just really need a ride. Get out of here, please. Latunsky's neighbor also had an eerie encounter with a terrified man. And this kid has his, his face covered with a rag and a phone to his ear, and he's like, help me, help me, he's after me, he's after me, just scared to death out of his mind. This kid grabs my arm and clutches behind me, keep him away from me, keep him away from me, just scared out of his mind. The bizarre thing here is that neither of the men pressed charges, and one of them actually went back and spent more time with Latinsky. Then, on Christmas Eve of 2019, the family of 25-year-old college student and hairdresser Kevin Bacon reported him missing when he failed to show up for breakfast. Police began a search that led them to Latinsky's house, and the scene there was just horrifying. Latinsky had met Bacon on Grinder and lured him back to his place. There, Latinsky had stabbed Kevin in the back, slit his throat, and hung him upside down from a rafter in the ceiling. He had also cut off a portion of Kevin's testicles, cooked, and eaten it. Against his lawyer's best advice, Latunsky pleaded guilty to Kevin Bacon's murder earlier this year. He hasn't been sentenced yet. YouTube's Jeffree Star and actor Kevin Bacon, of the same name, paid tribute to his late victim. Our second case also takes place in Michigan, Detroit to be exact, where 20-year-old India Mackey is joshing around with her 18-year-old boyfriend Kevin Dixon in a parked van. The couple have an argument and things suddenly begin to take a dark turn as Dixon threatens to shoot India. India begins filming Dixon. You think I'm playing, huh? Okay. You think I'm playing, huh? Hit you with this big 4-5 hollow tips, gonna eat your up. Just moments after this video was taken, Dixon shot India to death. He then moved her to the passenger seat of his car and called his mother, attempting to get her to hide evidence of his crime. He was soon pulled over for erratic driving, and India's body was discovered. Dixon pled guilty to second-degree murder this year, while his mother was charged with two felonies as an accessory after the fact and tampering with evidence. The last case we're covering takes place in Fallbrook, California, 
where Laura Salinas lives with her husband, Jorward Estacchio, her two kids, and her mother, Cynthia Sidabaka. Cynthia did not get along with her son-in-law, Jorward. Jorward was a rugby coach with a disciplinary personality. He was strict with his kids and argumentative with both his wife and his mother. He took umbrage with Cynthia smoking around his kids and would even spray her with water whenever she did so. Cynthia also claimed he was physically, verbally, and even sexually abusive with Laura and the children. On February 11th, 2014, incidentally Cynthia's birthday, Jorward was getting ready to take his daughter to her spelling bee. Cynthia was planning on going as well, but Jorward told her that her outfit was too ghetto and she couldn't go. The two had a yelling match, and then Cynthia retrieved a gun and shot Jorward in the back 15 times. He tried to crawl away and lock the house door to get away from her, but she shot him through the door. Cynthia then went to the casino to celebrate before being picked up by police. During her interrogation, Cynthia showed no remorse. Quite the opposite, in fact. Thumbs down. He didn't like me. Is he dead? You tell me. He's gotta be dead. You think he's dead? I hope so. Clean. I love you. He said that to you? Yeah. After you shot him, he said, Grandma, I love you? Yeah. God damn. I think he ought to be. Boom, boom. Is he alive? He's not? Oh, good. Good, 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 good. Oh, thank you. She's in jail for life. So it was just sad to see uh, all the craziness, the crazy people in this world. Um, from the Jeffrey Dahmer's copycat, to the grandma, to the boyfriend, you know, and all that, to the police officer. So this is why I tell you guys to be aware of your surroundings and be careful with what you say, do, how you approach people, what you say to people, because we never know what mental issues or what someone could be going through and just a little negativity inside their life could make it where they could just spaz out and, and give up. And this is why we have to be nice to each other. We have to be kind and courteous of uh, other people. You know, if you catch that strong eye contact, there's nothing wrong with saying hi, good morning, have a blessed day. Anything uh, that's a nice gesture to make people feel like it will be okay because we're all going through stuff. Just our problems are different, but we all have them.